Welcome to the Real Business of Wine session on sex and wine. Um, why are we doing it? What are we doing? This is something that Polly Hammond and I have talked about over the last few weeks as we were talking about the way wine is marketed and sold and so on and various conversations that we've both had with consultancy clients, with other people. Um, as, is wine something that should be marketed to men, to women? And if you've got a wine called Cupcake or Layer Cake or Ménage à Trois uh, that's very clearly aimed at a female audience, is that okay? And I know plenty of women who think it isn't. By the same token, we've got wines with names like Sledgehammer, Carnivore, and uh, Gentleman's Collection, and I think probably most famously recently, 19 Crimes. And 19 Crimes, produced by Treasury Wine Estates, was overtly created to hit a particular demographic of 18 to 35 year old, but particularly at the lower end, men specifically in the Anglo-Saxon world, particularly in America, who were seen as being not wine drinkers. How did they get those men to come back to wine or to come to wine from the first, in the first place instead of spirits or beer, craft ales and so on? And the one thing we know is that 19 Crimes has been a phenomenal success and actually women have bought it as well but it has actually done what they were int intending to do. So Polly and I don't necessarily agree on all aspects of gender marketing, whether wine should or shouldn't be uh, set up in this way. And I decided to use the little image behind my head as a way to kick this off, because if you buy a razor, a, a Fusion 5 Gillette razor for men, it comes with the word power and you buy any either of these other two razors and they're all about protection and intuition and sensitivity and these are ways of looking at razors are they ways of looking at wine so polly how do you see gender marketing in wine and in general it's the big question start with the big question um i i think it's interesting as a, as a female who's also a wine, uh, wine marketer, because my opinion on it is very, uh, very binary between, you know, how I view the work that I've done, my, my position as a female raising two daughters versus sometimes my clients need to, to make money. Um, and, and so I think that for myself, and maybe for a lot of people who are considering gender marketing in wine, it's, uh, it is a very difficult question to answer. Is it appropriate? What is the motivation? What are the potential wins? How does it, it affect your brand in the long run? How do we position this in the context of you know, our primary label, second labels? What's the lifespan? of a gender-based brand. I mean, you ran with Gillette, the one that if I could use a, a virtual here, I would have gone with the Bic pins, which was one of the most beautiful failures of gender marketing of, of all time. But it's not always a failure. I have clients who have gender-directed um, brands, and those brands carry their, their wineries for them. So I'm not going to say the answer is black and white, but I hope that what we can get to by the end of, of tonight's session is actually a clearer understanding of why we make those decisions, when they're appropriate, and what the pros and cons for your bottom line may be. Okay, can we go back one stage? And I, I, this little slide behind me is one that I like to use. It's very hard to read at this size, and you can probably see it later on. But the words behind me, I'm just gonna get out of the way of this, which is, this is quite interesting, that nearly 40% of French women never drink wine. This was in 2015. I don't know what the figure is today, but we'll see. But it came down from 47% who don't drink wine at all. And that is of, of all ages. In fact, if we look at the age cohorts, younger women are even less likely to drink wine in France. Uh, and certainly young men are less likely to drink wine, wine in France. But one question I want to come back to is a fundamental one, is do men and women see stuff differently because when I'm having this conversation with all sorts of my friends particularly women they resent the idea that the female brain is in any way different to the male brain the female attitudes are, why do we have to um, focus differently on 
50% of the population to the other 50%. And then we get into the question of if they are different, then is it nature or is it nurture? And then we move into something else, which is that if we do start producing um, pink razor blades, or indeed bottles of wine called cupcake or whatever, are we not perpetuating something that may not have been nature, it may have been nurture in the first place, um, are we not turning women into what we think they ought to be? Are we not saying, uh, you're not a princess, we're going to make you into more of a princess, or for a boy, we're going to turn you into more of a soldier, or whatever it is, in the, in the caricature way? Yeah, yeah, um, I, I actually have some research from the American Psychological Association, um, where they have come out and stated that gender has little or no bearing on a person's personality, cognition, or leadership abilities. So, you know, statistics, lies, take it for what you want. But there is a lot of research coming out now. And in fact, with Gen Z, we're seeing more and more instances of young people being raised in what is a very gender accepting or gender fluid environment. And we aren't getting the same nurture um, decisions that perhaps when you and I were growing up would have been quite common. Now, I know that you and I actually have a different opinion on nature versus nurture. Um, and, and I'm willing to share mine, you know, quite publicly, which is I, I do really believe that that nurture and that parenting and that even from the beginning. So a great place to start on this are the issues of just to go off track for a minute. Toys are the very first place where gender marketing begins. And we see um, we see it in the business and the economics and the pricing and the presentation. Um, and it's, it's also been huge as we're looking at burgeoning young spenders. Um, so if you grow up in a space where you have pink dolls, the question is, are you more likely to buy pink razors, pink pins, and, and pink wine? Where does it begin? How much are we a product of a system? Well, I did a, a very small survey um, earlier today, I mean, it's about the smallest survey, I almost the smallest survey I could have done. Um, but my two kids are 15 and 13, and uh, one is male and the other is female. And I asked them whether they thought there was a difference in the way boys and girls think um, and behave and so on. Or how much did, did they did they think that it was the way that, that they're, they're being brought up and their friends are being brought up. They, interestingly enough, think that there is a difference. Um, uh, they absolutely um, look at it. Uh, my son says, yeah, we are definitely more physical. Um, we are more likely okay. as boys, and I've got a very gentle son, but, you know, we're more likely to hit each other than um, the girls are. The girls are more likely to look at things uh, emotionally uh, than we are. And actually, my daughter looked, actually did, did acknowledge that that might be the case. And if you do look at this, whether it is nurture or nurture, uh, nature or nurture, um, and in the case of our kids, I certainly, we certainly didn't go down the route of saying, oh, we've got a, a son, here's a gun and a, and a khaki uniform, here's a girl, here's a princess outfit and, and some pink. We certainly didn't do that. Uh, but let's assume it is nurture. Actually, the behavioral thing that happens, and there's, if you look at Baron Cohen's book on, on this, which is uh, The Essential Difference, he genuinely believes that the behavior patterns are very, very different as adults. And then you look at, there's a very, I think a very good book on the marketing to women called Inside Her Pretty Little Head, which was um, produced by, written by two women who worked for Ogilvy. And they were working in a group of, with a group of men. And at one point they were asked to um, help sell a laptop to women. They wanted more female buyers and they'd been chewing over it for a couple of days and eventually one of the men said look we're wasting our time why don't we just make it pink and one of these women said to the other we're out of here women in the the age who are going to buy a laptop they're 25 plus 30 plus it's going to cost a thousand dollars whatever it is to buy a laptop they're not just going to buy it because it's pink I, I want to argue the the logic, the assumptions that sit behind everything from what your kid said, because I did the same thing. I went out to my children day and I was like, how do you feel about this? Um, so when I ask my 18 year old today, 
what she said is there is a very big difference between us making the decision for them and them making the decision for themselves. You want to make a pink laptop? Make a pink laptop, but sell it to everyone. Don't assume that a pink laptop is only interesting to a woman. And I think that that is where we get into wine. That's where we get into the assumptions, these historical biases, because we are run by old white men that say, I want men to barbecue and I'm going to make big, heavy red blends, but women want to be light and airy and on Instagram, so we're going to sell them rosé. We know that this is ass because we know that men love rosé. The statistics show us that men buy and enjoy rosé. It's our assumption, not the the presentation and that's where i think that we need to look at how we at what we are calling gender marketing again that gets interesting because i had a long conversation with liz gabe who's the mm-hmm. master of wine rose. she's just written the book on rose and she said we talked about the color of rose and she is pretty bored with the fact that all rose has to be the, the same provence color Interestingly, there is a, apparently there's a kickback to deeper color roses, which men are more likely to buy. Now that's not all men, but the idea of the claret section um, is, seems to be, uh, it seems to have a slot and where uh, the, the pale pink rosé has, has established itself. And you can see the image behind me, um, which is a, a brand that was produced in the States recently um, very much for Chardonnay and pink wine, produced by a woman, interestingly enough, for a female audience. Um, it's very much targeted in that way. Now, the question, as you're saying, is that maybe there's going to be women who say, I don't want that pink, that light pink, and they're going to go for the deeper color, and men the same way. But you've still got a general demographic idea. So, so okay, a couple things. I, I hate demographics, like from a marketing standpoint, I don't like demographics. I don't recommend that my clients use traditional demographics. I don't, we don't use gender as a demographic in any of the work that we do because we do not feel that it is applicable. When I work with New Zealand clients, sometimes this can be a bit of a problem because they are uh, in some respects much more old school in how they look at things. Um, but when we are, we're working with American clients, the, you know, take gender out of everything that you do. I, I want to talk about what I've seen in gender marketing because, and I'm certain you've gotten this too. When you're working with clients, you get people who come to you with all sorts of positions, ideas, goals, whatever, right? So what I found is that gender marketing tends to come from four basic categories. So one is it's, it's an accident. It's a bias from within their marketing team. They're not trying to be misogynist. They're not trying to be sexist. They just can only see the world through their purview. And that is something that I know the American Marketing Association is doing a lot of research on to try to get the numbers. Self-reporting on it is very bad. Most marketers will tell you that they are not biased, but then when you actually look at the campaigns that roll out, they are living in a bubble. Okay, so that's one. You've got accidental. Then you've got three tracks of intentional gender marketing. So one of them is exploitative. And and this is the one that gets us into trouble where we really don't care about what we're doing. We just look at it and say, hey, there's a market for that and we're going to run with it. We're going to make a lot of money off of it, we hope, and it's going to possibly be short-lived and we'll deal with the the fallout. So there's, there's exploitative. Then... There's what I would describe as um, as intentional and trying to be good spirited, right? So they think that they're not being exploitative. It's like the, the gender equivalent to greenwashing, you know, that they actually think they're doing a good thing. And the example that I'm going to use, and you might you might disagree with me on this, is Jane Walker was such a great example. Jane Walker thought that they were doing something really empowering for women by by putting that out there. Big questions about that. Then you actually have, and these are the ones that I think are important to bear in mind, we do have gender-based marketing that is coming from a position of honesty and altruism, where a brand, generally a female-led brand, is trying to do something better 
for their audience that they identify with. And that has a bunch of, a bunch of foundations that make that work. Some of it is charitable giving. Um, that's probably the most common one. A lot of it is diversity in their messaging. So the problem that we have, or the question we have is, what is the motivation that backs up that decision? And that is often an issue of economics and the size of the company who is making the decision. I'm going to pick up on two things here, but I love the, the fact that you've just given me the opportunity of putting this slide up behind me, which is by Simon Baron Cohen, whose the book, The Essential Difference, is controversial because it is the one that says that we are wired differently as far as he's concerned. He sees the male brain as being closer to what is often described as the autistic brain. Um, and it is, uh, as he sees it, uh, less empathetic and that the, these two quotes come up from, from behind here, which is that uh, the way uh, women will tend to see it is more with a more emotional bent, and men will tend to be more interested in the nuts and bolts of the thing. Um, and I think that's quite an interesting way, and I certainly, when I look at my kids and I look at other kids, I don't, I, it, it does make some sense to me. But you come back to what you were just saying a second ago, which is, what is the brand? And I think that's something that the wine industry, and it's a much bigger question than we're discussing in terms of, of gender marketing, is what are you building? Are you trying to build a legacy brand that is going to be around in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years time? Um, that's what, if you like, with uh, Le Grand Noir in terms of the wines we're producing and some of my other projects that I'm looking at. Oh, did Robert just freeze? That's going to be hard with only the two of us talking. Um, okay, so while Robert catches up, I actually am going to ask a question. I'm going to answer Lorenzo's question. So Lorenzo, hi. This is quite weird having to run the Q and A and and talk on the screen. So Lorenzo, you ask, what about the fact that women's wine consumption has been and still is largely overlooked by wine business marketing strategies? Um, I mean, I, would, I hope that Robert can catch up with us soon because I know that he has got some very strong opinions on this. But from my standpoint, what I've seen as a wine marketer does come down to these four reasons that we do it. Um, if and, and where the funding comes from that. So if you're looking at it as what I'm going to describe as exploitative, intentional, you are actually, you are often big money. You are doing it because a marketing department has gone out, they've done their demographics, they've said, we think that we can roll this out and we can sell wine to this many more women. The problem with that then is the largest, I'm answering Lorenzo's question, the largest examples that we have of it are the ones that make us itchy, that we look at and we're like, oh, this doesn't quite feel right. It feels a little bit sexist and kind of demeaning, and I'm not the kind of woman who would buy that sort of wine. So what we need is more awareness, more publicity, more examples if we're going to have gender-based marketing, if it even applies. Okay, let's just ask that question right away. Don't we need more examples of the non-large corporate versions of it? And instead looking at smaller producers who are coming from a position of altruism, diversity, and this comes into Robert's. Hi, Robert, are you there? Can you hear I'm us? I'm back and I'm gonna bring Lorenzo in because he's got a question. That, um... I, I'm actually answering his question right ah, now. Ah, okay, sorry, I missed yeah. that bit, yes. We've, we've been doing that while you were gone. Right. Hi, Lorenzo, come join us, say hi tonight. Does Lorenzo have a voice? Not at the second. Um, um, so I just wanted to say, I think that this comes down to the slide that's behind your head, which is this notion of someone says, women behave this way and men oh. behave this way. Hi, Lorenzo. Sorry, I added Hi. the wrong uh, headset without the microphone. It's okay. No problem. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Uh, well, Paul, I'm totally with you in the sense that I also hate demographics. I, I just wrote um, a post last week uh, that 20 years ago, everybody was talking about psychographic at least, and talking about demographics seemed dull, but now everybody talking about millennials. And about the gender um, issue, I'm pretty with you. Uh, my point is that often in Italy, 
uh, we uh, forget that there are a lot of women drinking wine also. And I don't see the problem in terms of positioning, so in strategic marketing, sometimes can be a problem um, in terms of tactical marketing, because we, everything is set to specific places. I don't know if it against gender marketing, but I, I see a problem that uh, every time that um, we develop a, a strategy, we almost uh, don't consider that Pinot Grigio is, uh, and Prosecco. Pinot Grigio and Prosecco are drunk by maybe 50-50, or maybe more women. Lorenzo, I have a question about that. Do you feel that that is because of Italian uh, of leadership of just the Italian issues of leadership? Do you feel that the that we have a fair representation of women in leadership roles in wine brands? Because that makes a huge difference in this conversation when you get around the table. Well, uh, I have to say that not only in uh, in wine before I was working spirits uh, and in cold cuts. Marketing is, since at least 15 years, is a female um, profession. In, in Italy, in all the wineries, in marketing, at the head of marketing, pretty often there is a lady. And maybe, and maybe it is not so nice. It is a lady because when uh, the, the, the son of the owner started to enter in the company, the, uh, the guy goes to make wine, and the girl go to marketing. But nevertheless, nevertheless, um, I, 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 I'm, as a marketer. As a marketer, as a marketer, we still have KPIs that we have to report back to leadership. And if we, and, and that means that we often don't have the, um, the tether to do something that might promote a change, might, might actually move the world forward a little bit, but it's going to risk that bottom line. So that's why leadership in this discussion is so important. Sorry, did I'm I derail? I'm going to raise a little. Yeah. Are you there, um, Lorenzo? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I mean, I, I, I don't want to monopolize the, the conversation because really you did that. Um, that session about Italy. And so you had uh, Allegrini, you have Donna Fugata, even at Antinori, uh, there are the daughters. So um, I, I don't know if it is a problem. Okay. And uh, honestly, I mean, I'm thinking while talking, which is not a nice thing to do. Uh, it's what we do every night. No, Come on no, in, no. it's all okay. Uh, and also yesterday, I was not sure we were talking about uh, wine and sex because after 8 p.m. my dog start uh, complaining because they want their, their, their dinner. So the, the last thing, the, the last part of the session I never get so clearly. But uh, I, 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 still, I remember so clearly that I was trying so hard in the companies, in the wineries to say, remember that there are also women drinking our wines. Can I just chip in here? Because see, Lorenzo has given me the, 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 the you gave okay. me the excuse to put, you, you, you Lorenzo, you know this, uh, Lorenzo, you know this image behind me, I, I think. I know that the, the, the image, uh, you, can, you, you have to get in the conversation Stan Novak because this was done, I think it was- exactly. Was, done by simple, if I'm not wrong. It was, but it was done in Italy with a German female director. It was a, it was a yes. movie. Uh, and these women, these naked women, who I think may have been Russian, I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, it was done to promote Friuli in Russia. And the two things that occur to me, one is when I'm at Italy, um, whether we'd have that image, there are a lot of very well what an American or an Australian or Brit would call very sexist images on the stands using uh, women wearing fewer or, or no clothes. When I'm at the simple uh, offices in Moscow, um, these kind of images, very well shot, beautiful art, arty, but nude women 
And I'm being, I'm working with Simple, there are my importer in Russia, but they, the, the, the female uh, executives working in the company live within this and in a way that perhaps their equivalents in California wouldn't dream of in, in a second. So we might bring Stan in in a second, but Lorenzo, I'm interested to hear your uh, well, the, your, the reaction your here in Italy it. was uh, was very bad about this thing, and because uh, it was it was seen too sexy, too sexy, too sexiest, even for Italian market. Uh, I can tell you another another thing in a winery. I don't say the name that I was working for. I many years ago. I suggested a project uh, to make a sparkling rosé wine called Eros, just because it's the anagram of rosé. Eros. 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 Not okay. the Eros. Yes, sorry. Yeah. So right backwards. But, uh, the, and what happened? Uh, and I, I was thinking at, at the positioning uh, for both sexes. I mean, not for men or, or female, for both of them. But uh, was turned off because it was thought too kind of too outrageous, too too heavy, too. So that's that's actually a really good segue into the other side of this conversation, which is this is not just about marketing to women. I mean, mm -hmm. we have male directed brands. I know Felicity Carter, who can't be with us here tonight, has done a lot of research on this. I know Robert, you have as well. Um, so. Can mm -hmm. you actually talk to us about some of the findings? Who Who's rolling out the brands and not just 19 Crimes? Let's talk about some of the other ones. Who are rolling them out? What I am very curious about is that um, historically in gender based or in gender divided products, you see differences in price points. Um, in some instances with the women's being much higher and in other cases with the men's product being much higher. So can we shift to talk about the other side of gender marketing for a minute? Uh, well, again, I'm going to stay with the, the, the background for, for a second. We're talking to um, Stephanie Gallo, who we're going to have on in a few weeks here. Her view within Gallo, they launch a lot of wines every year that most people never see. When I say launch, they test market them in various uh, either regions or in, in other ways. But for example, she talked about one of the wines they, they produce, which was very specifically in what she calls soccer moms. Now it's 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 actually it's not women, men, or a particular group of people whom they see fitting. Now what was interesting was she said we aimed them at soccer moms, and actually that particular brand worked, but the people who were buying it didn't turn out to be the soccer moms. And so the question that that Gallo had to think about was, should we change our marketing, because we're not. The, 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 the people we thought we were talking to aren't seeing the product, or should we accept that it's actually satisfying a different uh, demographic or different group of people and actually be happy that they're buying it? And that I think is quite an interesting way of looking at it, where what they say uh, at Gallo and, I've, and the wine group is the same, I think most of these companies are the same, which is a very different way from the traditional European model, is we know who we're making our wine for. Now, whether we're making our wine for men or for women or for younger men or whatever, that, that's a very different thing for the, I've inherited my vineyard from my father and we grow this grape because this is what my father grew or what the local laws say. And does that take us one beyond the, 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 the gender marketing question? Well, I, I, I was told to not go too far off into my, my liberal gender marketing opinions, but I'm going to anyway, um, which is what happens when you roll out a brand that is directed toward females and you discover that gay men love it. And this has happened. Like we've seen this across the board in all sorts of products, not just wine. What happens when you roll something out and you know, you realize, and actually a big issue with some of the, the women's directed marketing are the ones that start to step on issues of um, what is it? Age appropriate marketing. And actually you get this with men as well. This is another thing. I'm going to talk about the garage beer project in New Zealand, because I think that I, I wish that I could um, video share. Everybody go look up garage project beer in New Zealand. 
they they fell into for a very long time the like beer bitches and babes category of you know bombs and all that kind of stuff on their packaging it was very sort of gung-ho male beer packaging they hit a point a few years back where they started rolling out beer in crown capped bottles with beautiful floral designs on it, where suddenly they're marketing these products to women. Except what happens is the women are still buying the, the bombs, bitches and babes beer and the men are buying the, the beer in the, with the beautiful crown caps with the bottles. The point being, they didn't dictate who had to buy it. They just put it out there and let us do what we needed to do. They're not advertising them in Chick Mags versus GQ, which is another really big issue that comes into the economics of marketing and large wineries versus small independents like I work with. That, that's an interesting piece of, and, and, and um, Stephanie Gallo actually very much uh, acknowledged that when it's talking. And I think, as I recall, I think um, to your point, the um, the soccer mom wine actually did hit a gay market very successfully. And I think if we look at Treasury, um, you've got 19 crimes that was brought in for its essentially young male uh, target and has worked with that group, but has also sold beyond that. But they also brought in Embrazen, which is an, ex an absolutely very directly female focused brand all about empowering uh, women and the, the opposite if you like of 19 crimes which is all about men there's one woman on in 19 crimes was brought in later on which was interesting and a, a convict but initially they're all men who'd done mm -hmm. supposedly bad things versus the embracing which was all about women who had actually done good things and strong things very very different approach and on the shelves, they just sit there waiting to be picked up by whoever wants to pick them up. Yeah. I, I just, I wanna, I wanna shift gears for a moment on this because I think there's something we have to talk about when we're discussing gender marketing um, in alcohol. Um, I do, so at Five Forest, we do a lot of visual work and that means that we go through repos of imagery. And one of the things I notice when you're looking up pictures of women and wine, there are a lot of pictures of just trashy. I mean, you know, we've had everything from bondage to nude boobs, you know, you really go the sex route. But the other large subset of pictures that you see when you look up women and wine are alcoholics. Women who have over I mean, like really graphic images, pregnant women drinking. I mean, these are stock photos, obviously, but pregnant women drinking. And I think that this represents a, uh, a conflict that we have, a, a historic, emotional, mental conflict that we have about what women are allowed to drink how women are allowed to drink. You know, if we go back to spirits, the appropriateness, I, I've heard so many people say, I never would have seen my mom drink a spirit. You know, those, those messages carry on with us. How do we overcome that? How can we use gender marketing in a positive way to change the stereotypes, the negative stereotypes about who is consuming our product? I think that's a very, a very good way. You could argue, but I'm just going to see if I can put a slide up behind me. Um, I think that what Treasury wanted to do with Embrace was very much that concept of um, saying actually wine is a perfectly um, valid thing to do because it's it's actually a, um, it's a drink that fits in people's lives. Let me just find this here and I can put this up behind me, I hope. Um, but nobody I, asks I men that, to drink something. Wait, hold on. Nobody asks men to drink something that fits within their lives, right? This is really the thing. Women, it's like, oh, you can drink it with your girlfriends or you can drink it while you're in the kitchen making dinner by yourself. It's always the, it fits within the context of your life. Men get to drink because they want to drink. And that's, that's a, that's a, problem we have when we talk about alcohol and gender. Um, oh. Do we have a Robert? 
So, so actually, um, because Robert is frozen and he's getting um, him himself back in, hopefully, um, I was going to, oh shoot, we had somebody in the audience that I absolutely wanted to bring in and I know that she had to go because she was parenting. Damn, 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 damn. Um, so we'll go back to some questions from the audience. What, what do marketing strategies and tactics that include both genders? Um, I think, I think that the, the issue of including both genders is really the issue of not including gender at all. Like, is it something that either we see because we, we need to help make a change or do we not see it because we don't want to promote ongoing stereotypes? So Stan is asked, so women need to be allowed to drink. Yeah, I think that a lot of gender marketing for women in alcohol has been this message of, it's okay, it's okay, because we live in a space where the assumption is that it's not. And that is, that is a lot of what we hear. That's a lot of the rhetoric that you still hear about women drinking. And we see that pervasively in news, in media, in TV, in photography. So, so yeah, I think that we are countering that. Hi, Robert. Back and here behind me are the two images that I wanted to get. Uh, 19 Crides, very much for men, and in brazen. Even the picture's I'm, smaller. Uh, the bottles are smaller, so I'm not sure they are smaller, actually. No, I mean, I, it's just because it fits behind my head. Which is I'm teasing you. It's just what I did quickly. Uh, but I'm so, I'm basically, I've got such questionable connections here. I'm just nervous I'm going to disappear. I'm not sure that the female drinking thing is, is, is as much of a problem in terms of, uh, I think men make it worse. Um, I was at a conference in Australia where people were talking about Sauvignon Blanc, and the male uh, wine makers and others, uh, in fact, there was a, an Australian woman who was complaining about hearing men in the wine industry in Australia talking about Sauvignon Blanc as bitch diesel. Cougar juice. Um, cougar all juice the, and so on. All the language, yeah. Yeah, but I'm not sure that the women who are drinking the Pinot Grigio or the Sauvignon Blanc or the Prosecco, A, whether they're aware of it, or B, whether they actually mind. I think that they're actually, they are, as Lorenzo was saying, that we, women are drinking more wine than men and have been for a very long time. Um, I don't, uh, did they see it as a problem? I mean, you know what I, what I find really interesting about that is that it, we talk about wine, especially on this show, five nights a week, right? We talk about wine and education and entertainment. When we talk about wine with men, we're talking about education. We must teach them how to love our fabulous wines. When we talk about wine with women, we talk about, oh, it's cute and it's bubbly and it's entertaining and drink exactly where you are right now. And I actually think that this does a disservice to both genders. Like it, it says, and we see this with some, of, with some of the male directed wines that you talk about, you know, the red blends and the carnivores and the sledgehammers and all of that. There's this notion, and it is important, and I'm not trying to be wholly black and white, there's this notion that we meet them at their place. But that is more prevalent, I think, in a female-directed brand than it is in a male-directed brand. I think in a male brand, it's all about how do we enfold them into wine so that one day they become a DRC drinker. Nobody's talking what, about women like they're DRC drinkers. What is interesting to me is having done quite a lot of work in Asia, Mm -hmm. um, if you actually run wine classes in Hong Kong, in Japan, um, in mainland China, you generally see more women than men. And women are very, very keen on learning all of the stuff that the non-fluffy stuff, if you like, certainly in Asia, it's something that I see a lot of mm -hmm. where women actually want to know um, as much about wine as there is to know. So there's definitely none of that um, fluffy over here, uh, detail over there. Having said that, I think if you do talk to people who've been marketing wine, certainly in the UK and certainly in other in um, in the West, and we kind of come back to the book that that I referred to earlier, um, the inside her pretty little head. What they said, these two women who said we don't want to sell pink laptops because that's just simplistic. They divided the world up into products that were actually user friendly and products that actually had barriers to users that didn't need to be there. 
And one of the questions they came up with was to say that men, because very often they are um, insecure, men will go out and buy a car that says 24 valves or 48 valves and they'll buy a computer that's got Intel 6 or Intel 8 or whatever because they want to tell their friend that they've got a bigger computer. And when it comes to wines, uh, they want the, the 100 points rather than the 98 points. Whereas at their point, and whether you agree or you don't agree it, they said, look, the, the Apple they saw as being the ultimate female friendly in this sense, or the, the, the non uh, that side of the male side of it. They just make a product that looks nice and does the job. And when you bought an Apple computer, you weren't buying it because of its processing. Well, I mean, the aesthetics of Apple have always been, um, have always been about sleek, clean, non-complicated usability. It's the antithesis, in fact, of what we do with an awful lot of wine. And I know that you wanted to talk about European wine. It's also the antithesis to what we do with European wines, because I can tell you, I work in wine. I live with, you know, a man who's gone through the diploma program, is going through the dip diploma program. We got loads of wine all around us. I'm here in Barcelona and I go to try to buy wine and I just look at it and I'm like, ah, oh, European labels. It's hard for me to figure out what it is. What am I getting? Will I like it? Have I ever had it before? American, you know, non, non-European, they, they simplify it. They learn to tone that down. I think that that's a little bit off topic from, from gender. I actually want to go back to what, what we were talking about with the economics of it. So um, you know, we do by and large still live in a world where women make less than men. What does this mean for the cupcakes in the world, the barefoot, the flip flops, the little black dress wine, and the price points and the targeting that is happening for these wines versus the wines that are predominantly sold for men. Robert, are those are what are the price points comparatively with the carnivores and sledgehammer and 19 wines compared to barefoot and cupcake and so on? Well, I think again, it's, you've, you've asked the question that I, I'm very glad that you, you raised the point because when you come to the computers, which there that was the the image that that, the, that they were talking about. The, the complication of the one on, on my one side of the male and the simplicity of the fem female, or not simplicity, but the neatness, the cleanness. Um, and then if you actually look at it in terms of wine, and I, I'm going to talk to your, your point about yeah. price. Um, we actually look at this because essentially those on the top are quintessentially the complicated you've got to have understood and gone to school and you know, so. And on the right, there is the, the product, you know the brand, you see the label, you understand it, but they're not cheap brands. And I think that's one of the things that we've been seeing, both male and female. And if you look at the Orange Swift uh, wines or the top end of the Prisoner wines and so on, uh, those, whether they're selling to men or women, are wines that you can actually see what you're getting and understand it and it doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily have to, to be unnecessarily complicated and that to a lot of people is talked about talking down dumbing down the product is cloudy bay is whispering angel a dumbed down product or is it actually just giving the, the customer something that they can recognize and know they're going to get what they like i've got a note mm -hmm. from lorenzo up here by the way saying simplistic marketing doesn't work very often yeah. um, and he's saying, do I see cupcake, or do we see any of those? Cupcake is a gender proposition. He saw it more as a lifestyle with no gender. I personally, I have to say, everything I've ever seen about cupcake and all of the marketing everything about it has been female, um, uh, female focus. That's been my view. I mean, I actually, I'll tell you, I love cupcake as as a brand i'm not a sablonc fan but i actually love where they went with that um and, and the purpose behind it so that's why i say that uh, on one i'm really divided because on this one hand i don't want somebody talking down to me about wine i mean this is a great thing talking about the the gatekeepers and gender marketing is just as big an issue i i know that there will be women who watch this who've had this exact same experience that you go in for a really nice dinner 
And the, what do they do? They put the white in front of the woman or the rosé in front of the woman and the red in front of the man and how often they get it wrong. So I do think that this is, this is a top down um, shift that has to happen in understanding the role of women in consumption right now. And I think that this comes back to your original slide and what we about before we went live tonight, which is what are the issues with women growing into wine? Well, one of the issues is that other industries make it a hell of a lot easier for women to spend our money. And you talked about a legacy brand. I want to bring up something. So um, everybody who knows me knows that I, I have a love affair with an old legacy brand that's called Lanva, L-A-N-V-I-N, that everything about it right down to the logo is about women and it, it's based on a mother and her beautiful daughter right uh, there's there it's been it's this is actually the oldest a couture house in france it is a great example of the fact that a a female directed a female-led story i mean do we even have to talk about coco chanel these are not things that don't happen in other industries and they make it very simple to onboard us but it doesn't happen so much in wine. Karen had a message about, um, hi Karen, about fine wine. You know, the, the position of women in fine wine, the language of fine wine, the, the inclusion. You go to events where it's you and a whole bunch of dudes sitting around drinking really expensive wine. Get us in the door. Get us in the door because we're good for the door. I think that's, that's a very good point. When we had Jancis Robinson a few weeks ago, the point she made was when she first got into wine in the 1980s, Basically, um, she was one of the very few women in the room. That is no longer the case. Now, we've, we're going to go on to uh, inclusiveness and diversity in, in other ways. That's going to come up on, on other occasions. But I think that the, the part of the battle of the male-female uh, thing outside Europe has been won. I think one of the points that, and I'd be interested to hear what Lorenzo uh, has to say on this, but um, when I look at uh, a lot of the European wine industry, if a woman is running a wine business, it very often is because she's got the same name as the company. Um, she's inherited it one way or the other. Um, I think Maggie Henriquez is, 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 is such a wonderful example of a woman who's been brought in from uh, on the outside to run a very major business, but there aren't that many of those women. Um, right. Yeah, I think there are more women buyers than, than producers. So, I mean, this is a really this is a really good segue into what my concern is when I go into a brand and I look at how they are or are not representing, or you know, gender, um, acknowledging gender. Um, and, and if they are, if they're engaging in gender-based marketing, I am always concerned about relevance. It is something that worked with the mindset, I think, of the boomers and with older Gen X. Yes, see, I acknowledge Gen X. Um, but we know from data that this does not work for younger millennials, and it definitely doesn't work for Gen Z. So it's saying... What's, what's the longevity of these choices? If you're treasury and you can whip out a bunch of wine and they can come and go, no big deal. But, but is this appropriate? And are we future-proofing ourselves when today we invest money in creating a brand that has a gender bias? I, I would feel very uncomfortable as a marketer doing it. We have had situations where this has come up and in some form or fashion, we have stepped out of it. Um, actually, uh, Lorenzo is teasing you by saying that by, by doing the generations, you are doing demographics there. Um, I'm going to throw something no. else in from the outside, which is, of course, the whole natural wine thing, I think, has changed the, the picture as well. Because if you take the two sides of the equation on the one side, and I love to put these together because I know it upsets people. On the one side, you've got the bourbon barrel uh, wines that are thought of very often by non, by wine people as being focused on men. And in fact, they're very popular with women because bourbon in America is very popular with women and that, and that works. But the other side of the coin, um, you talk about natural wine and the whole glue glue thing and so on, um, actually does seem to cut across all uh, questions of demographics or certainly, well, not necessarily age-wise but necessarily, but certainly male-female. Yeah. Um, and that I think is quite interesting. And there's a note from um, Karen here about talking about are wines with uh, cartoons necessarily for hipsters. 
I think they may, I think maybe that is true, but they're not necessarily male or female hipsters. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, I think that what happened was they they removed themselves so much from tradition that they were able to define an entirely new space. And this is why, you know, we, we love to fight back and forth. That's why traditional wine and natural wine have such a problem. And by doing that, they gave themselves the space to talk about, to present, to market, to advertise, however they wanted. And for that, I mean, I, I think that we owe, we owe a great deal to natural wine for breaking down barriers in production and presentation, marketing of wine. We also, what it was, was it was breaking down traditions of that of the nepotism and of the inheritance and of the legacies and saying there's a space for new people to come in and take risk and try things and that immediately opens the door to more inclusivity more diversity so yeah awesome great how many more ways can we do that and how many more fights are we willing to engage in where we've got the traditionally marketed wines just blasting anyone who's coming in and saying the status quo needs to go. But in a way, I think you're, 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 you're again opening the door for what we're going to be talking uh, to with Blake Gray tomorrow night mm -hmm. about, which is the moment I, I'm at fault, not at fault, but I'm part of this picture because I've just raised the, the issue of natural wines and we all go off on that. Natural wines are a drop in the wine ocean, 99 point whatever percent of people have never come across them. Actually, 19 crimes with its uh, augmented reality labels, with the fact that they had the courage to tell a story that wasn't about wine. They said, look, people want stories, but they don't necessarily want stories about people with vineyards and barrels and so on. They actually like stories about convicts who were sent to Australia. Actually, they have in their way done a huge amount to open wine out to a broader audience. And we could say the same for uh, Embrazen, which is not the best known of those brands. It's probably also touched more people than, than, than all of the natural wines. I mean, but again, it's doing some of that job. This, this, is, this branch is beyond gender issues, but this is always the case that the big money comes in and makes way for the rest of us to follow suit. Cupcake did the exact same thing. It gives us also the right to take risks. If they're doing it, we can do it. So in that sense, and this, this comes back to an age old marketing question, how bad is a bad decision if that bad decision makes room for good decisions along the way, right? And that is, that is a history of marketing that we see from legacy brands doing the greenwashing, great example, but they paid the money, they got the word out there, they opened the doors so that now other people don't have to have that same amount of investment to do good. I think the other thing to, to say, and there's a very note from Lorenzo, which I absolutely agree with here, saying natural wines are a drop in the ocean, but they are influencing the trend for the entire industry. Yes, but so, if you like, are the augmented reality labels that Treasury brought in. So both things are doing it. But something we've just seen, Gallo have just brought in a new rosé, just literally in the last two or three days. Post and Malone. it's a beautifully packaged bottle, but actually, to be fair, that the, 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 the person who really pioneered that kind of bottle was Gérard Bertrand. And a Frenchman brought in a wine that wasn't a Provence rosé, a uh, wine from Le Languedoc, but that did the, the, the Provence thing. And now Gallo have actually built on that. So it's-, it's I think Wait, are you talking about the Post Malone bottle? The just mm -hmm. the, the Post Malone? Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we've got the bottle, but we have so many other things to talk about with that one. Like we can do a whole topic yeah. on, on celebrity wines. Um, and we will. And, and we will. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess my, my issue with it is that we as a society, you know, we, we do still live in the world of the Madonna or the whore. And we do in some ways carry this through in gender-based marketing and wine. We're either talking about the little black dress, you know, or we're, you know, it, it, there's no space, I think, for a woman who, one, who, 
wants to learn, also wants to support, also wants to grow, also does want to be a girl. Like what you say all the time, sometimes you wear jeans, sometimes you wear a tuxedo. It's exactly the same thing for women. We may want to have something that falls into that women category without being spoken down to, without the, the imagery and the storytelling that we see right now that often can be very bimbo-esque. And that's the space that, that we need to get to. But does it, are we saying that the cupcakes and the little black dresses and the layer cakes and so on, are they valid or are they not valid? I think that they're important, but I don't think they need to be here for very long. But surely the market, I mean, this is maybe the, 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 the too neoliberal, and I'm certainly, I don't fit into that, that I don't want to sit in that category, but surely they will be here for as long as people will go on, go on buying them. And exactly. If, people, if something else comes along, and replaces them yep. and it may well be that whispering angel will or something modeled on that will be the replacement for the cupcake model or maybe so so a couple things um the first absolutely if that opens the door that gets somebody in that's brilliant second basic market economics as long as there's a demand there will be a supply when that changes it's out the window i mean i i really as a marketer i believe in in old-fashioned economics as as the the market you know the point that things change but what we haven't talked about and i know that we're at time are all are the other competition so if we look at how beer spirits hard seltzer ciders are marketing to women and actually how they are marketing to younger women right now and they are really kicking our ass on that front because they don't take themselves nearly as seriously mm -hmm as we do. So I, I tell a story about this one that we have in New Zealand. That's like white rhino. I know about it because my teenage daughters know about it, you know, and, and like a percentage of their um, profits go toward endangered species. They've got like great wake shark, elephant, all this other stuff. They've got pink bottles and light green bottles or cans, whatever. They have done a great job of taking our product, which is effectively alcohol, and making it accessible and taking away the gender connotations of it really you know like this is consumed by both men and both young men and young women and introducing people to something that we are not doing yeah i think you're absolutely right and i think that at the moment the wine industry is tends to think in a much more siloed way and that in the picture i put up behind me it is saying, oh, we are going to do wine for women, um, which uh, in a sense, I think wine is such a complicated product and it, it, there is so much baggage associated with it that I think maybe people are going for very simple answers because so far they've worked for some people. And so they're following. I think what the spirits people, and Lorenzo earlier on raised that question. He said 10 years ago, I think it was, uh, maybe 20 years ago, he said, if you were actually, you were told not to market spirits to women, because yeah. that wouldn't work. Now, if you're selling gin today, you definitely are ready to sell because we know that women are as ready to, to, to spend $30 or whatever the price is, $40 on a bottle of gin as men. And uh, gin is a wonderfully um, asexual, I would have said, uh, product where there's no um, argument as to who it's for, who it isn't for. Yeah. Um, I think we We're can time. carry on. There's a, there's a lot more we can go for here, and I think we've we've agreed rather too and much. We will. <laughs> yeah. But um, tomorrow night, I do want to quickly go on and say what we are doing tomorrow night because I'm looking forward to this. This is coming up for because something that Blake Gray, um, late of the San Francisco Chronicle, and he's the U.S. editor for uh, Wine Searcher, uh, wrote a piece this week um, about what he calls the wine intellectuals and the things that they say are true and important. Uh, and he lists them and including everyone's drinking sherry, the Riesling revival, nobody wants buttery Chardonnay anymore and so on. And he's gone through and he's demolished them one by one and saying actually none of these things that these people write about and say are actually true. Within uh, hours of him publishing that, of course, I've seen people certainly in the UK and elsewhere talking about straw men and saying it's not an article. And so I'm sure it's going to be a controversial uh, piece tomorrow night. I'm really looking forward to having some sparks flying 
and um, please come along to that. So Blake Bray, same time tomorrow, and I think the video of that will be, again, a very popular one. And I, I just want to say a great big thank you, because sitting here doing this tonight was actually the original idea six, eight months ago when we talked about doing podcasts and YouTube channels was that you and I bicker and argue behind the scenes all the time. And it was nice to get to do this. And it thank was, you to all the people who came along. And thank you for all the comments. And I hope we covered most of it. And if we didn't, we'll do it again next time. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Stay safe.